Hello, Wonder Hussy here, in the middle of nowhere again, but this time, I really mean it. Okay, I'm parked just to the side of this sort of causeway that goes through this ginormous, vast, desolate, dry lake bed, and it heads into nowhere. That's right, I'm headed from nowhere adjacent into the literal heart of nowhere. And by that I mean, well, if you're familiar with the Benchmark series of atlases, you know how on the back cover they have the state split up into squares, and there's one page for each square? Well, today I'm making a long-time dream of mine come true by going up into this uppermost northwestern corner of Nevada, which if you look at it, is pretty much totally blank. Uh, Okay, I guess that's not fair to say about the one or two people who might actually live in Vaya, but for the most part, (sighs) well, you can see for yourself, there aren't even any paved roads. Oh, maybe that red line is a paved road. I guess we'll find out. Anyway, it's a very remote part of the country. There's no gas, there's no services. There's almost certainly gonna be no cell phone reception, so, I've just uh, resupplied here in this little town called Cedarville, which is in California. It's on the California side of the border. We're right on the Nevada-California border. So I went in there and I got some uh, avocados and organic greens and stuff to eat. And then I went over and filled up my gas tank because I'm not gonna be able to get gas for a while. Anyway, I've always just been curious about what lies beyond. You know, like this blank page in the atlas, the stories that I've heard up this way. Uh, It's notorious dark skies. I think it's one of the only 10 designated dark skies areas in the entire world out there. (laughs) Well, it might sound like a boring void to you, but to me, (laughs) it sounds better than Disneyland. Let's get in the car and go find out what wonders the real heart of nowhere has to offer. Wow, look at this. And no, I don't mean this tampon that some idiot left down here. Golly, even in the middle of nowhere. Well, I'll go ahead and throw it away. It's it's a brand new unused tampon, so it's not that gross. Anyway, what I wanted to point out was this amazing view. Look at this vast emptiness. Oh my goodness, this is exactly what I was expecting to find out here. There's a sign here, just talks about how the uh, Applegate Trail pioneers crossed through this area. That's right, the pioneers that crossed uh, the plains and the mountains to go to California and try to find gold or get free land or whatever, they came through this area. And I can only imagine how rough it would have been doing this in a wagon. I mean, things are pretty comfortable in my Forerunner. I've got nice shocks and good suspension and beefy tires and I got a 12 volt refrigerator. Well, you didn't have any of that in a Conestoga wagon. Talk about rough travel. Okay, wow. This is Vaya. Remember, in that square on the back of the Benchmark Atlas, the only thing in this entire square worth even marking was Vaya. And this is all it is. Okay, well, to be fair, it's not just this little abandoned ranch. There's also that little abandoned ranch and that little abandoned trailer. And there's some kind of uh, county roadworks department up there that does the road stuff, maintains the gravel roads. And then I think there's a there's a guest ranch up there that you can rent, like a guest cabin. Oh, some dude in a side-by-side just drove by. I think he... Well, he probably thinks I'm going to trespass and go poking around these old historic buildings, which I'm not. They're marked no trespassing, and I'm going to be law-abiding. And Well, I guess I'm just going to get back in my rig and keep on traveling, because apparently Vaya isn't desolate enough for me to do what I want to do without being hassled by the man. This is more like it. Vaya just wasn't desolate enough for me. No, sir, I'm going even deeper into this page in the atlas. Uh, 
Well, I don't know if you saw on the road sign a ways back there, it said uh, Denio, D-E-N-I-O. I think that's how you pronounce it. That's where I will come out on the other side of this backcountry odyssey. I mapped out a route, and if I can take that route, then it should only be 75, 80 miles all the way through. But it's going to be a very slow 75, 80 miles. Because first of all, I'm going to be driving carefully on very poor roads for a lot of it. Secondly, I'm going to have to constantly stop to check out old cabins and abandoned ranches and hot springs. There's all kinds of stuff out here. I told you it was like Disneyland. Actually, all joking aside, this place is anything but Disneyland. If by Disneyland you mean a place that's fun and safe and they go around and pick up your trash after you, because it is definitely fun here, but they don't come around and pick up your trash after you. You gotta pack in, pack out. But it's also not necessarily safe. Matter of fact, there was a terrible story. Back in 1993, there was a young couple named Jim and Jennifer Stolpa. You might have heard about this. And I think they had a little a newborn baby with them, a young baby. And I think they were traveling from California to Idaho for Thanksgiving or something. And this area is blanketed in snow in the winter. I mean, you saw that sign, road not maintained in winter. This road here is closed in winter. I mean, this is a winter wonderland in winter, buried up. Well, you'd be buried up to your you-know-what in snow if you came out here. But unfortunately, that's just what happened to Jim and Jennifer Stolpa and their little baby. They were trying to take a shortcut. There was too much traffic on I-80, I guess. They came up this way. I'm not sure exactly where they ended up getting stuck, but it was, oh my God, you can look it up online. There's an episode of I Shouldn't Be Alive about it. That's pretty interesting. Uh, they ended up getting stuck in the snow. Jim ended up having to hike out 50 miles through the snow. And I don't even think he had snowshoes. I think he finally made it to Via and he was able to get help. And they went out and they got the wife and the baby and everybody survived. And I don't think any of them even had frostbite or anything. Well, maybe Jim, because he had to hike through the snow. Anyway, that's the kind of place this is. You don't just go tooling around here half cocked. And well, that's why I made sure to stock up on water, gas, food, everything I need. I have recovery gear. <laughs> I mean, I have a full size spare tire. I don't know if I have the muscles to change it, but <laughs> well, I buy the best tires I can afford and they're good ones. Uh, let's just hope they don't bust on this journey. <laughs> okay, just because we're in the middle of nowhere doesn't mean folks don't have a sense of humor. You can see there's all these really cool rock formations sort of jutting out of the sagebrush plain. And then there's this one rock jutting out of the sagebrush plain that somebody thought, well, it kind of looked like a shark. <laughs> that is too funny. I wonder who did that. I mean, somebody brought some paint a long way out into the middle of nowhere just to paint that rock. It's interesting because I never pictured that this part of the country would be so green. And I know some of you watching are probably like, you call this green? <laughs> but I don't know. I just sort of pictured it being like this flat, arid desert. But I guess it stands to reason because we are at elevation up here. Uh, I want to say we're at like 6,000 feet. I mean, remember, this whole area is covered in feet of snow in the wintertime. And you can definitely tell by some of the ruts in this dirt road. Probably wouldn't want to try this during the rainy season. Okay, wow. I just finished exploring one of the first of what I hope will be many abandoned and volunteer cabins out in this vast swath of the heart of darkness. I made a whole video showing you every last detail about that cabin, and you'll be able to check that out elsewhere on my channel. But for now, I guess I'm going to get back in my rig and keep on traveling because, golly, I think I still have... I probably still have something like 70 miles to go before I get out of this desolation. Dang it. Man, there was another uh, one of those uh, volunteer cabins I wanted to check out, but somebody's already staying at this one. 
And how do I know? Well, first of all, if I zoom in, you can see there's a tent out there, and you can see there's an American flag flying from the front porch. And well, I've mentioned this before, that's the custom at these volunteer cabins. Uh, you hoist the American flag when you get there to let other travelers know the cabin is occupied. Well, I've got plenty more stuff to check out. Uh, to be honest, the next part of this journey is hmm, kind of dicey. Uh, well, I want to go to this hot spring. And when I put it into Google Maps, well, there were two routes I could take. And one of them, well, they were both about the same time, three and a half hours, but one of them was like 137 miles and the other one was only something like 57 miles. So it was a substantial difference in mileage, but the same time, which of course means, oh, well, one of the roads is a lot worse than the other one. And so, you know me, I decided, oh gosh, well, I don't want to break down in the middle of nowhere, but, I don't want to take any paved roads. My goal on this trip is to try and get all the way to Denio without touching pavement. Now that's technically going to be impossible because, well, to get to Denio at the very end, I do have to get on a highway, but I was going to wait and see if I could avoid paved roads until that point. So even though this 57 mile route is probably going to be pretty gnarly, I did scope it out on uh, Google Maps satellite mode to make sure that it wasn't like too bad. And it looks like it's a pretty decent two track for most of it. There's a couple portions where you got to ford a creek. And I was kind of like, hmm, maybe I should just go the sure way. But then I thought, if I do that, then I have no business calling myself Wonder Hussy. So what I decided to do is I'm going to go ahead and try to take this wild route straight through the heart of this crazy wilderness. And by the way, when I say crazy wilderness, remember how I was talking earlier about how, uh, well, I was so excited to go to page 32 because all there is on page 32 is Via. And as we saw, Via wasn't anything. Well, I'm about to pass on to page 33. You can see Denio way up there in the corner. And 33 is even more barren. So you can see the kind of country I'm about to head into <laughs> on questionable roads. <laughs> Fingers crossed, we make it through to the other side. Oh my gosh, how about that? I didn't expect to run into a traffic jam way out here. Those guys were uh, towing horses. They had three horses all saddled up. Like they were out here horse packing or riding the range or maybe they were actually working cowboys. Who knows? Oh my God, that was wild. Uh, I'm following Google Maps like the proverbial idiot, but like I said, I did do my research. Uh, well, Google Maps led me to a locked gate. So fortunately, I was able to sort of figure out a way around it. <laughs> well, what looked like a sort of plan B to track. And well, I think I'm back on route. Okay, wow, this road is pretty gnarly. Uh, not really any gnarlier than I anticipated. Uh, I did have to do a creek crossing, which was one of the things I was kind of apprehensive about, but it turned out to be nothing. So I would tentatively say so far so good. I'm going real slow though. I'm only averaging maybe 10, 15 miles an hour. So it's taking forever. <laughs> that being said, <laughs> you know, I should probably be trying to make good time, but I don't know, when am I ever going to be out here again? And as I was driving along, I happened to pass, well, it looks like an old abandoned sheep herder's cabin or something. I mean, whoever lived out here was remote. But actually, you know, I keep going on about how remote this part of the country is. Well, I always tend to forget. The whole West used to be this remote. <laughs> you know, there weren't any towns. There weren't any paved roads. It was all like this. Everybody lived 20 miles from the nearest neighbor. Okay, I'll just be real quick here so I can get back on the road, but huh. I was curious. Uh, just a small 
well, I guess it was a three-room affair. Nothing much left now but the old wood-burning stove. Busted up bits and pieces of tarp. It's got an interesting green cast because of this sheet of corrugated fiberglass on the window. But fortunately, there are no personal effects left in this cabin. Nothing to go by to make up some kind of weird story. Oh, well, I mean, I guess this is kind of cool. Uh, somebody nailed old beer cans up to block out the wind, but these are those really old Coors cans from way back in the day. And because it's on the inside of the cabin, the color is still preserved. Oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, to be honest, though, I'm relieved that there wasn't a bunch of cool stuff in there because whew, I gotta make tracks. If the rest of this road is as rough as it's been, which I have a feeling it's going to be, if not worse, it's gonna take me... Well, I was, to be honest, not planning to camp in this Dark Skies Preserve tonight. I was gonna keep on going to this hot spring, which is right outside the preserve, but well, I don't know. I don't want to drive too long. So, well, maybe I will end up camping here. Why not? I've passed plenty of amazing places to camp. Incidentally, while I'm walking back to the car, let me address uh, something that many of you might be thinking, uh, and that is what kind of idiot goes out into a desolate area like this with no cell signal <laughs> using Google Maps? I mean, that's like a recipe for disaster, right? Well, sort of, but I'm doing it <laughs> as smart as I can. First off, you can download a map on Google. So I downloaded a map of this whole area so it saved all the little roads and it can navigate me wherever I'm going. Secondly, remember, I do have my benchmark atlas. And well, guess what? Locked gates aren't really shown on the benchmark atlas either. Usually, sometimes they are. So that ranch that Google led me to either that I had to skirt around, well, that would have happened to me if I was following the Atlas anyway. Okay, wow. <laughs> what? spectacular country. Did you see those wild horses? Oh my god. I don't know if I got a very good shot of them, but there was... God, it had to be dozens of them just stampeding through this sagebrush flat, kicking up clouds of dust. It was majestic. Oh. Even more majestic is the fact that I'm back on a pretty decent road. Man, some of those roads I went on were gnarly. Uh, I could barely even see the road at times. And, well, never really got bad enough that I thought I'd have to turn around. And now I'm about halfway to this hot spring that I wanted to camp at tonight. If I have to go as slow as I've been going, I won't make it. I'll just camp somewhere else. But if the road stays good like this, which I have a feeling it will, because, well, first of all, there's a road grader right there. And secondly, how about that? Haven't seen one of those in, well, it feels like forever that I left cedarville this morning oh my goodness this is the longest what did i say it was going to be 80 miles well it's the longest whatever it is i've ever driven man these are rough miles but it's friggin beautiful i'm glad i'm doing it it's something i've always wanted to do and i feel a lot better now because well if you look at the street sign well you can see we're on badger mountain road and at the intersection of Soldier Meadows Road. And why would it make me feel better to be at the intersection of Badger Mountain Road and Soldier Meadows Road? Well, that's because I've actually driven up Soldier Meadows Road before when I did that expedition with my friend Jessica and our girlfriend uh, Marge. We all <laughs> drove up this way. I'm pretty sure we took this right. And as I recall, the roads we traveled on on that trip weren't really that bad. So <laughs> fingers crossed the worst is behind me. <laughs> oh my gosh. I got all excited because I saw another car and it's the first car I've seen, well, since I left uh, Cedarville, basically. But this car doesn't look like it's going anywhere anytime soon. Oh my goodness, somebody crashed it, look. This is scary, the airbag deployed. Oh wow, I've never actually touched an deployed airbag before. I'm curious what it feels like. Oh, it's much more solid material than I would have expected. It's almost like canvas. Yikes, I hope I never have to experience that myself. I wonder if somebody was drinking and driving and just ran off the road. I mean, I'm definitely not saying that because I just left uh, a Native American reservation. I'm saying that because, well, there is an old Mike's Hard Lemonade. Mmm, black cherry. Oh man, now I want a Mike's Hard Lemonade. That's my guilty 
secret guilty pleasure. Anyway, I digress. This poor little Ford Focus is really in a pickle here. And that's probably because it has a pickle <laughs> as a bumper sticker. Well, hopefully everyone's okay and nobody was severely injured. Uh, I don't have time to make up a whole scenario about that now. I still have... Oh, I'm making pretty good time now. The road is so much better. But I feel like I still have mm, at least 15, 20 miles to go if I want to camp at this hot spring. Oh my god. Not gonna lie, there were times I thought we'd never make it, but we finally did make it to this hot spring. But I don't know, man, looking at it, <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, I don't know. I mean, there's algae on the sides, but it looks like, oh gosh, it's not even really hot. It's like a hundred maybe. Well, that's what I read. This hot spring is actually in the uh, hot spring guidebook, you know, the commercially available hot pools of the northwest hot pools of the southwest well this one's in hot pools of the southwest and that book did say that it wasn't that hot and that book did say that there was a lot of algae around the side matter of fact that book recommends you bring a uh, one of those molded plastic deck chairs to sit in in the middle of the hot springs i guess it's not that deep well, to be honest it does feel pretty good i mean it's warm it's not hot i mean it does feel pretty good after all that bumpy driving. Oh my goodness, my poor rig. But she did great. Yay, go Toyota. <laughs> Man, talk about overlanding. You know, you see all these posers riding around town to the mall and to Costco with their snorkels and their rooftop tents. And well, if they go overlanding, they probably go someplace like Yosemite or, you know, the Grand Canyon, someplace that anybody can go. <laughs> What I just did was true overlanding. I feel like this might be a pretty good place to get in my floaty. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of too late in the day right now. I think I better just figure out where I'm going to camp. Well, if I was a successful YouTuber, this would be the point in the video where I had an epic drone shot flying high above my lonely little campsite to emphasize how small it is in the vastness of this landscape. But unfortunately, my drone crashed the other day and it's out of commission. And oh my God, if there was ever a video where drone footage would have been amazing, it's this one. Because the vastness of those desolate valleys, oh my God, I mean, it could, the scale could really only be captured by a, a drone shot way overhead. But since the drone's broken, I'll have to make do with my stubby little arms. So I kind of parked on a bluff overlooking this, well, I guess it's a lake, but it's a really interesting looking lake. And apologies, I know it's backlit because the sun's going down behind the mountains over there. And oh my gosh, it's going to be a beautiful sunset. But if I pan over this way, maybe you'll see what I'm talking about. Uh, it's, it looks like a white salty crust but it's unusual because there's grass growing up right up to the edge of it. You know, normally with these uh, salty salt pan type lakes, alkaline lakes, you don't see grass at the edge like that. So I'm not sure, maybe it's not a totally salty lake. I mean, there's, you can hear there's plenty of birds squawking and flapping all over. You might be able to even see some of the little guys out there. There they are playing happily in the sunset in the shallows. And then if I pan over this way, there's cows grazing peacefully on the meadow, right on the edge of this giant bazaar. Mm, I guess I'm gonna go ahead and call it a lake. Matter of fact, I know it's a lake. I just checked the atlas and it's called Gridley Lake. So that's where I'm camping tonight, Gridley Lake. It's actually just right over the hill from the hot spring. I think it's a great place to camp for the night, but I'll be honest, man, I could have just parked in a Walmart parking lot and passed out because I'm pooped. You wouldn't think sitting on your ass driving all day would be so tiresome, but man, off-roading is <laughs> was kind of a workout. I hate to say that because it's not really a workout, but gosh, I was thinking and I was kind of nervous and I was maybe <laughs> clenching the wheel a little bit too tightly. <laughs> anyway, we made it. We're here. I feel very safe because I'm not that far from the paved road. Uh, not going back there yet. Like I said, I'm going to spend a peaceful night out here in this beautiful wilderness. And then we'll finish our journey 
by hitting up fabulous Denio Junction for gasoline in the morning. Ugh, well, this was a great and very peaceful place to camp, but what a bummer about these hot springs. I mean, if you think I'm crazy for even bothering to come out here, here's what it looks like in the hot spring guidebook. This picture must be old. It's called the Devil's Faucet, and apparently there used to be a little pier going out into it, and this little sign. Well, that's the downside to using these hot spring guidebooks. Uh, you never know when the last time this thing was updated. Anyway, great campsite, loved it. Bummer about the hot spring, but I'm not gonna let that ruin my day. Oh man. Here we are, the pavement. Man, I was really hoping I could make it all the way to the gas station in Denio Junction without going on the pavement. Well, to be honest, I guess I've had my fill of off-roading. I just did 80 miles of bumpy, dusty, dirty, muddy, rocky, rutted roads. <laughs> and I'm ready to get back to civilization. All right, we made it to the gas station. <laughs> Just afraid to see how much it's gonna cost. Not too bad for this day and age. We did it. We successfully crossed the two, well, I was gonna say the two most empty corners on the back page of the Nevada Benchmark Atlas. But now that I'm looking at it, I mean, we went from Cedarville, which is like over there, all the way through Kind of like that. They came out here. And they're pretty desolate. But look at number 36. There's nothing in that square except for something called Midas. And that's not even really in 36. It's on 44. <sighs> now I guess I'm going to have to go over to Midas and check out what's in square 36. But I'll save that adventure for another day. Right now, I'm just going to go in this gas station here and take advantage of their free Wi-Fi and some ice cream. <laughs>